Thank you, Nora. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, Mar Gavler. Uh, since I started going to uh, presentations at the library and, uh, and also field trips with the club, uh, from time to time, uh, Marg has been right there presenting uh, you know, slideshows and uh, wonderful photography of her own at the library. And uh, I've been with her on some field trips, uh, especially uh, getting some botany uh, lessons along the way. And it's just a, a treat. Uh, Marg also um, invited the club to her own property, which is uh, a, a previously a farm that's uh, being allowed to go natural. And that's uh, just down, uh, I think, just southeast of Irish Lake. So that was uh, two years ago, or maybe three now, I've lost track. But uh, that was a real treat. So it's uh, when Marg is always coming up with uh, presentations to offer. And it's a delight that we can finally get to see this when it was scheduled for last year and had to be rescheduled for this, this season. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this. And I was saying, as I was saying earlier, uh, since I heard about this presentation that was coming to the club, uh, I was at the library and I just came across the book that was about Sable Island. So I got that one out and another one. And it was just about the horses. It was for kids. And it was a real uh, thrill to be able to read about uh, the Geology and all the stuff underwater, which is just a big sand dune that shifts. So I'm not going to say anymore. Uh, but then also recently reading um, an old uh, Farley Mowat book, uh, with, uh, Gray Seas Under, it was written in the 50s. And he's talking about Sable Island and how they dealt with that in the, the ship salvage business. And also, um, uh, more recently, I was rereading my copy of. Of sailing alone around the world, which was written over uh, 120 years ago uh, by Joshua Slocum. And uh, when he departed on his round the, the world voyage by himself in his sailboat, the Spray, uh, he headed out from Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. And over the next uh, 24 to 48, 48 hours, Sable Island became part of his story, too. So I'm just going to leave it at that and look forward to Nora's, I mean, excuse me, uh, Mark's presentation. Thank you very much. So you ready for me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm heard. Okay. I will start. Um, <clears throat> Sable Island, it's a mythical island in some ways. It's in the middle of ocean waters. It's had a varied history of about 400 years of off and on human habitation. But now it is one of Nova Scotia's national parks populated by horses, seals, and birds. A few park staff are there all year and a few more come in the summer for scientific studies and student training. So with considerable excitement and anticipation, my daughter and I arrived at the ship, the Ocean Endeavor, which would take us there. <clears throat> we found our stateroom and were delighted to see comfortable space, first a sitting area and a bedroom area where we were awakened every morning by Stefan's good morning, good morning, good morning, with his Norwegian accent. Because actually the um, Ocean Endeavor is a Norwegian ship. That, so then after introductions and a practice of the lifeboat routine, we left the dock at St. John's and accompanied by a pilot boat, which led us slowly out of St. John's Harbor. <clears throat> we had a wonderful dinner on board, the first of many we were pleased to enjoy. And then we looked back at the Narrows and the evening view of St. John's. 
This map <laughs> shows the route from St. John's uh, Newfoundland to the tiny Sable Island, which is down here. <clears throat> it's just a little spit of sand. Just a minute, I didn't want me to go, go back to where I was. <clears throat> it's just a little spit of sand, but still part of Nova Scotia. 175 uh, kilometers south of Nova Scotia. It rests on the eastern Grand Banks, a continental shelf on the east coast. Millions of years ago, rivers and ocean currents from the north uh, <coughs> dumped sand there during the last glacial retreat. There are no rocks, cliffs, stones, or soil just very fine gravel and sand. It is the re most remote island in Canada. After a day at sea, we woke the next morning, already anchored right here on the north side of Sable Island. With 125 days a year of heavy fog, and surrounded by dangerous shoals. Uh, <clears throat> the island is called the graveyard of the Atlantic. All these dots that you see around, those are actually numbers. And they show the 350 or more shipwrecks from the mid 1500s to the mid 1900s. But then early in 1800, the Nova Scotia government uh, established a life-saving station and lighthouses on the island to warn ships and attempt to rescue survivors. Our first morning, bright and clear, <laughs> made for an ideal trip to the island. Clad in our wet gear and boots, uh, we shed our gear when we got to the, uh, to the island and moved off to enjoy the first day of our adventure. The 160 trip participants were ferried each day in the dozen or so uh, zodiacs which were stored on the ship. The island is only about 50% covered in vegetation. Its climate is moderated by the Atlantic Ocean, making the temperature generally between minus five and plus five Celsius in the winter, and a maximum of 25 Celsius in the summer. The cool Labrador current, current from the Northeast flowing south to the Grand Banks and the warm, powerful Gulf Stream from the south meet at Sable Island's western tip creating huge crashing waves, <laughs> um, but the surrounding sandbars slow the, the uh, huge storm waves, helping to protect the island. Walking farther inland, this was our first sight of the horses. <clears throat> In the 1950s, uh, with the advent of modern technology, the life-saving station was no longer needed, and there was some discussion about whether to remove the wild horses as well. However, public opinion uh, prevailed, and it was agreed <clears throat> that the horses would remain as feral animals. They are now legally protected under the Coast Guard Act, living without any human interaction, including no veterinarian care. Visitors like ourselves now have the benefit of observing horses in their natural surroundings. Altogether, there are about 550 of them on the island. <clears throat> All visitors are required to maintain a distance of 20 meters from the horses. So any images that look a lot closer are simply thanks to my zoom lens. <clears throat> Here we watched, fascinated, <clears throat> as a mother and foal 
separated a short distance from the rest of their band, but they usually don't stay for long. Then they were joined by others. The horses mostly travel in small family groups or gangs as the locals call them. One stallion is in charge with one or two mares and their foals and often a yearling or two making up the group. <clears throat> the eldest mare leads the band while the stallion takes up the rear, keeping a watchful eye on them. The foals often wandered alone for a short time, but not for too long. So this one was soon joined by another. And again, they're not too far from their mothers. And then for this foal, it was time for lunch. A little farther over, another band moved on to a different location. As we walked slowly following our guide, I caught a close up of a stallion and a mare. They had their sleek summer coats having lost all of their winter coats. The main food for the horses is this marum grass, but it, the grass is also a necessity for the stability of the sand, as the root system holds it all together. In stark contrast here <clears throat> was the brown horse in the middle, a yearling or maybe a two-year-old, which had not lost its uh, winter coat, which is typical of the younger horses. It seems to take them a longer time. <clears throat> Another pair of young horses watched over a foal lying comfortably in the grass. Sharing a babysitting seemed to be a common practice. The horses interacted in various ways. These two, perhaps a mare and her yearling, were what they called necking, a very common activity of the horses. They nibbled each other, mostly in the neck area, and often for quite a while. Then we saw another mare watching over her tired foal. And here were a pair of mares with their foals. <clears throat> uh, the horses were continually on the move, slowly shifting their positions as they grazed. They often wandered a little apart from their band for short times. As for me, I always felt a sense of calm and wonder as I observed the comings and goings and interactions between the horses. Sable Island's feral horses <clears throat> most likely first arrived with other animals introduced, introduced in 1737 to provide food for stranded mariners. Several years later, 60 horses confiscated from expelled Acadians on the mainland were also shipped to the island. Uh, and during the 1800s until 1940s, some horses were rounded up each year by the resident superintendent and sold at auctions in Halifax. And some horses, Arabs from Alberta or even Belgium, were shipped out to the island from mainland Nova Scotia in order to expand the genetic pool. The genetic pool. <clears throat> During the time of the life-saving station, some horses were tamed for draft work around the station homes and the lighthouses or to help in rescue operations. 
Then when the station was disbanded and staff and domestic animals left, the feral horses remained on the island. These descendants of the original horses are now the only terrestrial manor, mammals on the island. <clears throat> now for over 250 years, these horses with their thick winter coats have adapted to the harsh winter storms. Here we saw an older mare and probably her yearly offspring nuzzle each other. These stocky and strong stable island horses from almost black to a dark chestnut to a warm golden taffy. And then we watched our previously seen foal follow its mother. He then sniffed the air <clears throat> and they were joined by another foal and its mother. <clears throat> A little farther off, this shaggy mare, so she has mostly her winter coat still. She was stood there watching her foal. Sable Island is only 1.3 kilometers at its widest, so it is possible to see the ocean on both sides from a high enough point in the middle. So the top picture was taken from a hill relatively close to the north, north shore where our ship was anchored, while the lower picture from the same place looked across the island to the south shore with the ocean just in view. Each sandy shore stretches for 42 kilometers, the full length of the island. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the horses moved, and of course, we moved too, so that we could see as many different groupings as we could. and as many different activities as we could. Whether just two adults hanging out to get together, or these two were possibly stallions not too happy with each other, and they maybe had started um, a fight, but then didn't continue it. <clears throat> <clears throat> or just one alone, this one seemingly on a mission. <clears throat> then we arrived at one of only two ponds on the island, where many bands congregate at their main source of water to drink. The irises and lilies were bonus. As the horses hung around the pond for some time, they interacted in various ways and some engaged in necking uh, with different horses. <clears throat> these two horses, these two mares, <clears throat> probably from separate bands, greeted each other and did some necking while the foal stood by and then when the one horse left the other uh, the other mother and her foal posed for me this way back mare uh, the one behind engaged with others from time to time. Another horse decided it was a good time for a roll, just because it felt so good.
and then it was time to get up and have a good shake. This stallion leisurely walked across the pond on his way to meet and spend some time with another younger horse, perhaps related. Farther over, these three horses all lined up like this. I'm not sure why, but it did make for an interesting picture. And here again, our sway back mare kept an eye on the foal we saw in the last picture, but it's not her foal. She didn't seem to have one of her own. So then the foal's mother took over and they moved off. But stopped short, <coughs> shortly for another nibble of grass. So I turned my attention back to <coughs> this pair <coughs> towards the end of the pond. So after some more necking, the younger one laid down for a rest while the older one kept watch, waiting patiently. Until it was time to get up and have another drink. <clears throat> and then they were ready to leave and join the others. Then the whole group uh, started to move off to a different place for grazing somewhere else. <clears throat> While some first had another drink and were joined by more who also wanted a last drink. But this foal had his own drink for mother. And before I, I, I left to move along, uh, so that other photographers could, could get some pictures, I captured a close up and a scenic shot of the prolific irises and pond lilies. And as we slowly meandered on our way, these black backed gulls caught my eye. They are the largest and most aggressive of the gulls, and unfortunately prey on the eggs and chicks of the many terns which come to the island for nesting. And I managed to catch, after several, several attempts, I must admit, a tern in flight. There are an esti estimated 2,750 breeding pairs of common terns that populate Sable Island during the breeding season, but visitors have to totally avoid their breeding grounds. <clears throat> As we walked through the sand, <clears throat> we approached a lower area where the hoof prints remained more distinct than usual. And that was because the sand here is slightly wet. The moisture here <clears throat> is due to an underground reservoir of fresh water, which floats on top of the denser salt water of the ocean just below the island. It provides water for the ponds, and for many plants and animals of the island. <clears throat> In this lowest place, the horses can paw the sand to reach the fresh water below. And that's particularly important uh, in the winter. There was a lake near the beach on the south side of the island at one time. 
houses and other buildings. But in the late 1800s, fierce storms washed away the dunes until the seawater breached the barrier. Now the lake is completely filled in, depri depriving the horses of another source of water. <clears throat> The island sand dunes <laughs> dominate the landscape, although they are continually shifting due to the influences of currents, wind, and waves. Some dunes are more than 30 meters high. There are no trees on Sable Island. Well, perhaps one near the station, which was planted with several thousand others but they didn't survive in the sand and the storms. So even after several decades, this lone tree is only five or six feet tall. Oh. I lost my place here. Okay, <clears throat> so heading back uh, towards the beach, uh, <clears throat> I pause to take a picture of this. Wait a minute, didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> I pause to take uh, a picture, a last picture of this beach pea. The beach pea grows in temperate coastal regions like Sable Island, which is one of Atlantic's coolest places in summer and warmest in the winter. So we came to the end of our first day, reluctant to leave this magical place. <clears throat> the following day, the morning was too foggy for the Zodiac trip to the island, but fortunately it lifted enough by the afternoon for us to get there and continue our, times with, our time with the horses and their irresistible foals. <clears throat> and soon we found uh, this mare as she tended her foal. This foal seemed to be bigger than most that we saw. <clears throat> and a little farther on, we watched another horse wandering through the lush vegetation. This vegetation is a result of the island's generous rainfall, averaging about 55 centimeters a year, as well as the frequent days of fog. <clears throat> With foggy dunes in the background and a family group in front, I again marveled at the peaceful landscape. <clears throat> then I caught a close-up again with my zoom lens, making me feel truly a part of this wonderful place. And as we moved, we watched this mare heading to join her band. And they were huddled closer than usual together. <clears throat> <clears throat> this young horse made me think of a typical bad hair day. <clears throat> In contrast to these neat youngsters, as they tried some graving, the same group that we saw the day before. A densely vegetated hillside Hillside <clears throat> attracted this group of horses and a low flying turn, which was a bonus. <clears throat> well, three generations busily grazed elsewhere. <clears throat> and this pair of foals <clears throat> again enjoyed grazing alone. I never tired of watching these little guys. As we moved from place to place, there was more dense vegetation. 
including some wildflowers. But my focus was on the horses, so I didn't stop to photograph them. <clears throat> <clears throat> This was the first time, and only time actually, that I saw this little foal, uh, a little darker than most of the others and younger. I don't remember seeing its mother, but my attention was on the foal. So no doubt she was not far away. Back at the pond, we saw the sway back mare again socializing with others. <clears throat> but having spent time there the previous day, we moved on <clears throat> to let others enjoy the pond activity. <clears throat> on our way, we saw this foal nibbling its mother, this fog still in evidence. And he dutifully followed her as she walked away. <clears throat> Our attention was soon attracted to this stallion <clears throat> away from his group as he went to <clears throat> check out something he thought amiss. <clears throat> his destination <clears throat> was another stallion which was too close to his band. <clears throat> so the following several slides continue the action, showing the fight between the two stallions. I couldn't say it was a very serious fight, <clears throat> but just enough to let the other uh, stallion know that he was not welcome. <clears throat> Till having chased away the offending stallion, he headed back to his gang, still somewhat miffed at the intrusion. Anyone who knows horses, when they have their ears back like that, that means they're not happy or they're angry or whatever. <clears throat> and they all moved away to a, peacefully to a different place. <clears throat> Their mother and son continued happily grazing. As we continued wandering through the sand, dunes, and marin grass, we saw another stallion deciding it was time for a roll. <clears throat> And he finished up getting back on his feet, having a good shake. And then it was time to move on. <clears throat> Here again, I got a close up of a mare, a lighter air, a lighter color than most we had seen. <clears throat> And one of a young horse, perhaps a yearling, still losing her winter coat. As the fog got thicker, I watched as this family grazed. And the foal grazing as well. And then they were joined by another member of the band. <clears throat> we again moved on and observed still another family as we headed back to the shore. Saying a final goodbye for the day as we walked over the grass mounds <clears throat> to where other members of our group had gathered. We saw artifacts or debris, <clears throat> which blow mostly onto the North shore, 
but soon gets covered by the blowing sand. <clears throat> None of the long gone shipwrecks are still visible. Most sank at sea, but one in particular they told us about, foundered near shore and lasted for several years before being broken apart by the relentless sea. So we joined the long line of other expedition members, sauntering back to our pickup point in no hurry to leave. The width of the beach fluctuates a great deal, as do most, most beaches. <clears throat> Ahead of us was a full zodiac, so we had time to look around. And we saw this gray seal trying to decide whether she should go into the water or not. She decided to give it a try. <clears throat> but changed her mind and came back on shore. It was unclear why she was alone, since most of the seals, some 45,000 of them, were congregated farther west on the south shore. The Sable Island breeding colony is the largest an estimated 300,000. They are now a protected species. Our seal then decided to rest she does look kind of sleepy. Then she settled down and waved us goodbye as we moved on to let her be. <clears throat> Meanwhile, <clears throat> waiting for the next zodiac, our spinners enjoyed a break. They did definitely seem to be enjoying it. <clears throat> <clears throat> and when it arrived, they turned around, that's why they're called spinners, <clears throat> so that we were headed back out to sea. <clears throat> we all climbed in for our return to our ship after more pleasant hours with the horses. The next day, while we waited out another foggy morning, <clears throat> The captain moved the ship about nine kilometers west, close to the main station, where both Parks Canada headquarters and the Environment Canada weather station are housed. We had hoped to visit the station, but we got tired of waiting for our turn, so moved off to see what we could see. Since the horses were not to be found, I paid more attention to the plant life like this wild rose. And then some loose strife. This lone stallion was the only one of the island's horses that we saw that afternoon. He was probably an older stallion, having lost his harem to a younger stallion. We now roam not an in frequent situation. As we walked on, we reached the second pond, west of the one we spent time at the previous two days. It was a good opportunity to photograph more flowers, particularly the abundant irises. First a close-up, and then a group shot. <clears throat> Even in the sand, but close to the moisture of the pond, the irises seem to thrive. And of course, the water lilies. <clears throat> Moving on, I found red fescue, far more proliferate in this part of the island. This view of the surroundings <clears throat> was a little farther east of the pond we, I had just been at. And as we looped back in the direction of our zodiacs, <clears throat> we 
we pass the disturbing sight of a coarse skeleton. But I had no desire to take a picture. <clears throat> the numbers of the Sable Island horses are generally stable, except for any unusually cold or stormy winter. Because they are totally adapted to the harsh climate, even in the winter, they can exist on the dried grass and the fat they put on in the summer. <clears throat> this was our last day. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> This was the last day, well, that's the, there. <clears throat> this was our last day here. <clears throat> and many of the more adventurous of our group, my daughter included, got up early and went for last one last trip ashore. <clears throat> At this location, the island was decidedly more narrow and it was easy to see beyond to the other side. I found this oil rig most intrusive but at least it was allowed no closer than a mile or so from the island. I heard that the oil company was seeking permission for more drilling in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but there was considerable opposition. <clears throat> <clears throat> On this part of the island, <clears throat> visitors are allowed only on the beach. Fortunately, the horses do spend a fair amount of time on or near the beach. <clears throat> Having passed on this excursion, unable to drag myself out of bed at such an early hour, I spent the time gazing from the deck of the ship, watching the people and the horses on the shore. <clears throat> waiting for the return of the Zodiac so we could return, could continue on our adventure. <clears throat> we sadly took our leave of Sable Island and steamed north above an area of the ocean called the Gully, <clears throat> which is a marine protected area. It is a massive underwater canyon over 8,000 feet at its deepest. 25 miles long and 10 miles wide, carved out as the ice ages receded. Being with many <clears throat> kinds of deep water marine life, it is the richest feeding area in North America. Underwater currents cause the upswelling of nutrients from the sea bottom. But all we were fortunate enough to see that day <clears throat> was this trio of bottlenosed whales. In our room, this map on the TV screen <clears throat> showed our path traveling from St. John's, sailing out to Sable Island, <clears throat> then moving a little farther west before heading back east and heading north back to Newfoundland <clears throat> and to our next stop. Although the morning, <clears throat> the uh, morning was sunny, we soon traveled into the fog. It was so thick we couldn't see anything from the ship as we steamed on. <clears throat> Finally, <clears throat> looming out of the fog was our destination a small community on the southwest side of Newfoundland. This rocky outcrop forms one side of the entrance to the small in inlet. <clears throat> As we moved a little farther in, the fog lifted somewhat, making the other side more visible. <clears throat> and then sitting at the end of the bay was this small community of only 85 people or so. It is accessible only by water. It's called Francois 
although it's pronounced by the locals as Francois, it is surrounded by rocky hills. As we walked up the boardwalk, <clears throat> we got a better view of the inlet and the, uh, the dock. and marveled at the vegetation, so profuse and lush, like the cinnamon fern, and these bunch berries. At the top of the steep hill, these tiny and delightful sheep laurel grew abundantly. We also got a perfect view of our ship in the bay. There wasn't much room to turn around, but our captain ma did manage. So we were headed in the right direction to leave the following morning. On the way back down <clears throat> the hill, we passed these twin flowers, but unfortunately almost finished blooming. <clears throat> We then had a pleasant evening of food and music hosted by the local townspeople in the community hall. <clears throat> Next morning, found us heading towards St. Pierre Mechelon. On arrival after leaving the ship, we waited here in our bus for the end of a heavy downpour, which shrouded the hotel. <clears throat> A trip around <clears throat> St. Pierre took us through a bit of fog, but not too much, so we were still able to see some of the island. <clears throat> Back in town, we saw some of the buildings, although it was still wet. Then we returned to our ship and enjoyed an evening of entertainment on board. Our ship traveled while we slept. So we awoke next morning to the site of St. John's Rock and the end of our journey. <clears throat> Back in St. John's Harbor, we disembarked, headed to our hotel and still had an afternoon to explore St. John's. <clears throat> These are some of the famed jelly bean houses. Perhaps you've heard of them. I'm not sure if I had, I think I had heard of them before. <clears throat> but they're, they're just all attached together and on the way down the hill. <clears throat> We also some of the very lovely uh, flower plantings uh, at many of the houses. So more of the jelly beans, but we did see several more uh, lining the, the steep streets. <clears throat> then it was time for my daughter and I to feast on an absolutely scrumptious lobster dinner at a restaurant we had seen earlier near our hotel. <clears throat> In the morning, my daughter left early for her fl flight to Calgary, but I had the morning to see this old, older part of St. John's downtown. <clears throat> and I also saw the twin whimsical parts. and the newer section, all in the lower part of the city, right next to the harbor. There were flowers everywhere, some also decorating uh, the outside of our hotel. Then later in the afternoon, beginning my flight home, I had a last glimpse of St. John's and the ocean. But as I left New Newfoundland, 
the vision of Sable Island's horses still danced in my head. Thank you. And that's it. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Marg, for um, presenting to us tonight. I, I've never really thought too much about Sable Island, and it's a fascinating spot. Uh, it is, absolutely. Yeah, and the horses are amazing. And the sand dunes, uh, perfect plover habitat, obviously. I don't know whether plovers go there. Uh, no, we didn't see any plovers. Um, there were the terns, and there is one... Oh, I've forgotten the name of it, but one little bird that only lives uh, on Sable Island. Um, my daughter did get a picture of it. I should try and uh, get a copy of it and add it to my presentation, but it, apparently that's the only place that one. So yes, there are a few birds. Um, mm -hmm, but... Uh, a unique habitat for sure. Um, one of the questions um, that we have is related to the hair shed by the horses. Is Did you find out whether it's used for nests? Uh, did I find out which? Whether the hair um, shed by horses is used for nests, birds' nests. Yes. Um, hmm. That wasn't specifically asked or answered, but it certainly makes sense because yeah. the, the turns all all nest in in one place. But as I said, we weren't allowed to to go there at all. So I had no I wasn't able to see what the nesting area looked like. Mm -hmm. OK, and then another question and you in a way you avoided this question. Um, was is related to the skeletons of horses and um, whether it takes a long time for their bodies to decompose because of the sand. Or do you know that? That's answer? dryness, yeah. Um, and again, I never heard an answer to that. Mind you, the skeleton that we did see <clears throat> was not a perfect uh, skeleton yet. It was still partly in the process of decomposition. Um, so I would assume it just, they, uh, they just gradually uh, decompose. <clears throat> and as with the, all of the artifacts um, on the beach, the blowing sand, I would assume would, <clears throat> would soon cover <clears throat> all of the, you know, any, any horse skeletons that were left, yes. Ah, somebody has your answer to the the type of of uh, sparrow, and I oh, where did it go? The Ipswich sparrow. That's right. That's what it is. Absolutely. It, the yeah. variety on Sable Island is unique to Sable Island. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, one of the ladies asks where the horses sleep. Where the horses sleep? Yeah. Just out, well, out in the open, but there are, as you, as you saw in some places where there's um, uh, a steeper hill. So my guess would be particularly in the winter um, during a, a fierce storm that they might be able to shelter there. But other than that, there, there is no place, um, you know, where they can hide or get very much uh, shelter for sure. So they're just, they're just there in the open. And I, what they also do is, uh, <clears throat> which I've seen other animals do as well, they huddle together. And I think that helps uh, them, them keep themselves warm. But <clears throat> as I said, the temperature in the temperature itself is not that cold, it's only, minus five to plus five Celsius. Mm -hmm. So it's cold enough and it's snow and ice and, and the blowing um, <coughs> storms are, are must be pretty horrendous. And, and we did see uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, staff 
uh, showed us some of the pictures of the islands in uh, in the winter, and it certainly is a desolate looking place. But yeah, they, no, the the horses do not have any safe, <laughs> cozy place to uh, to get out of the weather. Okay, I I'm expecting that maybe some of the staff at the the national park or the weather station are there year round. There are a few uh, during the winter. Um, there's staff there by, I think, mm, three or four people, just a small number. And and the staff usually the park and it's park staff as well. Um, there may be scientists there as well, but um, the the park staff they. Um, sort of rotate so they'll be on the island for maybe three or four months and then they'll switch and somebody else will come up and they can go home to Nova Scotia. But the interesting thing too <clears throat> is that there is no there's no dock, no uh, landing spot for ships. Hmm. Um, so any ship that does come or anyone that arrives by ship has to go in, you know, with by a zodiac or some small <coughs> um, boat. Uh, so I believe that the, the comings and goings all happen by plane, uh, small planes, and they can, and you could see in that picture of the people walking along the beach that the beach, and it may not be all of it, but in some places it's fairly flat and smooth. So the airplanes are able to land there and they have two or three um, <clears throat> smaller vehicles um, that can sort of uh, <clears throat> take people from the, where the plane lands to the place where the uh, <clears throat> habitations are. Okay. Does the, are you aware whether the size of the island is changing with the currents or the winds that are occurring? A sand spit seems to have a, a tendency to move. D does that well, one? Yes, definitely the sand moves, no question. And yes, it does. I'm not sure whether the total um, uh, area of the uh, um, island changes, or if, if so, how much. But one thing that um, they did tell us is that, um, I'm trying to think which one it is, chances are, anyway, the, the sand is um, moved by the waves from one end of the island, and it's probably that west stormy high, high wave end of the the west end of the island and then it seems to get uh, deposited at the opposite end at the east end of the island so it, yes the the this the sand um ends do do change somewhat hmm. very interesting you know um i think that's all of our questions or comments right now marg and i would really like to say thank you to you on behalf of Pam. I know she joined us. Um, I don't know whether she's able to say anything. So I'll, I'll just keep talking because I do like to talk. Um, <laughs> That's fine. But um, on behalf of the field naturalists, we're so thankful that uh, you were able to bring Sable Island to us and make it alive. And, and uh, that was certainly greatly appreciated. And I should mention um, at this point as well that we do have a presentation next month by David Turner. He's um, a local um, fellow from Flesherton area who loves birds and, and has uh, worked with plants quite a bit. But he's going to be on June the 10th, which is the same day as our AGM. And people are certainly invited to join us at that time. And I see Pam is her, her she's visible to me now, but I don't see that her microphone's on. So uh, maybe we'll close our meeting and um, just say thank you to you. And there's Pam. Oh, good.
she can thank us. She can end the program. Yes, thank you all so very much. Um, Marg, your presentation was awesome. It makes me want to go back to Newfoundland, that's for sure. That was one of my most favorite um, spots and memories with my husband when we uh, camped all over the island. Yeah. Sable Island yeah. sounds wonderful. It would be so nice. It, it um, is wonderful that you were able to be there. It makes you a little scared, I'm sure, to think that tourists are going on and off and perhaps with some of the disturbance, but um, I'm sure that the group you were with seemed to be very astute at how um, careful they were being not in Well, they are. They're very, yeah. It's very carefully, um, uh, what, managed, shall we say. And it's only in the, during the summers that some groups come, but they're, they're, they are strictly um, managed, you know, uh, so that uh, I wouldn't say that the tourists uh, and, and tourists, I don't think, I, I don't think they can go there alone or they may have to get permission. I'm not quite sure how that works, but certainly um, it, it is managed. And so tourists are not, um, are not a problem, put it that way. That's good because yeah. something like that must be unforgettable to see. Well, and then, and uh, yeah, and I would say it's unique in Canada. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it makes one wonder whether that, uh, whether it'll sort of last, last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Probably, I guess the most difficult thing might be if the ocean, uh, um, the ocean level rises, that might be a problem. But other than yeah, that, climate. as I say, it's, they seem to, uh, it seems to persist. Yes, I'm sure climate change is an issue for, uh, for that island too. Mm. Anyways, thank you very, very much for talking with us. It was just lovely to see your pictures. You're very knowledgeable. It was interesting listening to you. So thank you so much. And thank you to our membership for tuning in. My pleasure. Okay. Good night, everyone. I will see you next month at the annual general meeting. We have a few things to discuss. And we've got a couple of um, surprises for you, perhaps. And that will be a very good thing to do. And our, our board will be... Um, happy to share everything with you. So good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night.